I'm going to talk today about apologising for personal injury um, and, and the connection with that to the law of negligence. Um, it's something that I've been working on for some time, but in particular what I'm interested in is the rise of the protected apology, that is the, the apology that has been protected by legislation in such a way that it is supposed to stop lawyers and other people from advising people not to apologise. So the first question is, and I've got 13 of these slides, so they, they shouldn't wear you out. Um, it'll be my talking that does that. Um, so the question is, what's the perceived problem? Um, and the, there are two big ones. Um, one of them is the problem that an apology is seen and has traditionally been seen as necessarily an admission of liability. Um, and, so, and that leads to things like the advice not to apologise, um, because it might be ad an admission, um, and I'm going to talk about that somewhat later. Um, and the re one of the really big issues, that is what apologising does to an insurance contract. Because um, as, you, as you may be aware, it's very common for an insurance <coughs> contract to have something in it called a, um, an admissions and compromise clause, which says um, something like, um, well, this is the one from United Medical Protection's policy. It says, you must not make any admission, offer or promise in relation to any claim covered by this policy without our prior written consent. Now, if you have a clause like that in your contract, and nearly all insurance contracts do, it has traditionally been thought that if you apologised, that necessarily voided that contract. And obviously, that makes people anxious. The other, the other main... Um, problem that's perceived is this general perception that we've seen um, really since the 1980s um, and again in a, in a rolling pattern, I think this is actually something that happens every 15 years or so, a perception that there's an increased rate of litigation which is caused by a compensation culture, that's the English language, or a blame society which has been the Australian language. Um, both of those um, are based on I ideas that people are suing all the time and that this is causing terrible problems. Um, the evidence suggests otherwise in actual fact that although um, over a 30 year period until the 1990s there was some increase in litigation, since then there has if anything been a drop per capita. But of course at the time in 2000s we didn't know that, we didn't actually have the data to tell us that we actually had a drop per capita rather than an increase. Um, and um, this has been particularly so. What has happened, however, is that when somebody does get damages, they get very high levels of damages. Um, and the reason for this is, first of all, things like nurses' wages have actually increased. People's life expectancies when they get catastrophic injury is much greater than it was in the past. And so this does create a, an issue about how much money is being paid out for catastrophic injury in particular. Um, and again, with medicine, this is another focus where apology litigation and the question of apologising is very significant. In medicine, there's also an indication that per medical event, there is much less litigation than there has been in the past, but that in fact, again, damages awards, when they do come, are high. So these are, these are part of the reason why there was a concerted push in, use in Australia in the early 2000s to do something about tort reform. And one of the reforms that was carried out in Australia then was the protected apology. Now the protected apology, oh, I've got to press these buttons. The protected apology um, has existed since 1986 in Massachusetts when a, a, a Massachusetts senator um, whose daughter was killed in a car accident was distressed by the fact that nobody apologised, that the person who um, had carried out the accident didn't contact him or apologise or express regret in any way. And in 1986, the first of these pieces of legislation was passed. But really, most of the legislation in the common law world since then has been passed since, the, since around 2000 to 2002. And the Australian group um, has, um, is, is the one that I'm most familiar with. But we also have um, such material such uh, legislation in Canada in the UK of course they haven't needed it in New Zealand because they have comprehensive no-fault accident um, compensation in New Zealand and therefore you can apologize anyway um, 
So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the details of that legislation um, briefly, but I thought it's worth having a quick look at what second reading speeches said about this legislation when the legislation came in, because what one of the questions I would always have asked is, why would you pass legislation like this? So we have, um, first of all, I've just taken some pieces out of different pieces, uh, New South, the New South Wales Legislative Assembly and the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Um, if you have a look at the first one, the New South Wales Legislative Assembly, what I'd like to point out is that he talks about the fact that he was advised not to, not to apologise. And he also talks about something else, that um, in fact you should apologise. And I think this is one of, the quest one of the points about this legislation is that it's actually designed or hoping to not chill social intercourse in such a way that it actually creates more problems than, um, than an, that an apology creates more problems than it solves. Um, the House of Lords one is just in there because um, they're talking about perceptions of a compensation culture. So one of the things that I think needs to be addressed here is that a large part of what goes on in the legislation around tort reform has been about perceptions rather than reality. And to the extent where both in Australia and in the UK we have strong statements by the government saying we have to do something about the perceptions even though we know that there is no reality in these perceptions. So, so the big thing that these pieces of legislation have been um, <coughs> developed for is to try and reduce litigation. And not just to re reduce litigation, but actually to reduce the costs to insurers and to defendants um, of litigation for personal injury in general um, and, and negligence in particular. So the vast range of legal actions where this stuff is relevant is the law lie in the law of negligence, as you would expect. Now, the literature about what makes people sue is very interesting and it's huge and I can't go into all of it here. But what we can draw from some of that literature is that we do know when people are more likely to sue um, in broad terms. So we know, for example, that the higher the status of the plaintiff um, or the pursuer, that's because I'm being non-discriminatory against Scotland. I've mentioned the pursuer there because um, that's what the plaintiff's called in Scotland. So the higher status a person is socioeconomically, the more likely they are to sue. We know that. It's partly because they can afford to. The costs rules. Again, the more favourable the costs rules are to plaintiffs, the more likely they are to sue. This is one of the reasons why um, United States litigation tends to be more, more common than in the common law rules where costs against the loser are awarded. Um, the existence of jury trials. Now this is very significant also in the United States, but in Australia where there are very few jury trials for these sort of matters, um, largely for medical accidents, medical misadventures and largely in Victoria is really where there are jury trials in this sort of area now. But the one that is particularly of interest in this context to me is the cultural view of risk and blame. And that's where I think some discussion of what goes on in relation to apologies um, applies. So the idea that uh, apologies and that you may have a cultural view of when an apology is appropriate and when it isn't um, is important. Now, there are all sorts of difficulties about, about talking about community perceptions, of course. And, we can, and it's extraordinarily difficult and I think probably impossible to say there is an Australian view or there is an American view about when it's appropriate to apologise. But that doesn't mean it isn't appropriate to discuss the fact that, that we know that there are cultural ideas about when it's appropriate to apologise and that we can look at the literature, the background literature, um, and we can see that there is, um, that it's quite clear that humans in general um, use this thing called the apology. Indeed, one of the things that, that I discovered when I was looking at this and was um, really gobsmacked by was to read the stuff on evolutionary psychology and find all the literature, and there's a great deal, about the fact that primates are an apologising species. Um, or apologising groups of species. So we look at these traditions and we see that apologising 
or saying, you know, I'm wrong and, and I'm, I'm deferring to you, all that sort of stuff is done in most primate societies. And of course, it's really only in human societies that it's done through language, but other, but other groups, other species do it <coughs> by physical behaviour and so on. And we know that it reduces aggression. So for example, we know that when someone apologises to somebody else, your blood pressure is likely to drop. Um, and we know that when they don't, your blood pressure is likely to increase. So we actually have physiological responses to these kinds of things. We also know that apologies are sometimes seen as significant for healing, um, to um, reinstate a moral community so that people feel reintegrated back into that community. That's a large part of the work of Braithwaite and various other people who've worked on reintegrative shaming. That's the focus of apology that they're looking at there. Um, so this... Uh, these ideas and this, uh, this huge literature that can be found in psychology and sociology and in philosophy tells us a number of things that are very important about um, apologies. But what I haven't told you so far is that that literature also tells us something about the kind of apology that will reduce your blood pressure rather than the one that will increase it. Um, and what really is quite clear from the literature in all these domains is that an apology, in order to have that effect, must include an acknowledgement of fault. So it must include the idea that you actually say, it was my fault. So, now that's of course exactly the kind of thing that lawyers have been most terrified about. So, oh my God, you must not do anything. Think back to that um, insurance clause, you must not do anything that might be construed as an admission of fault and you must not do anything that says it was your fault. So the first question is, is such a thing an admission in negligence? Now this is, this is a very interesting point um, and I think um, if it is an admission, obviously there's, there's a big problem. If saying I'm sorry it was my fault is, uh, constitutes an admission, then it will void those insurance contracts. It, um, it might also, and there's also the question of it being admitted into court and being regarded as something akin to a confession. And we know there are a whole, there's a whole range of issues about confessions, particularly where you're dealing with juries. So coming back to whether it might be an admission, I just want to talk very briefly about a case um, called the Vuro case which was a case um, where some people, a, a corporation, De Vuro, imported seeds <coughs> from New Zealand and the seeds, which were released to growers, were canola seeds and somehow or other they were contaminated with some disease which meant that, the, um, that De Vuro itself, that the growers sustained economic loss because they couldn't sell these products. Um, whatever the seed grew into, either canola. Um, now, what, they, what the company did after this happened was something that their lawyers must have just about died when they proposed to do it. Or maybe they just never passed it by them in the first place. I'm really surprised that they did this. So they put out a, newspaper, they put out a statement in a newspaper and the statement said, um, we apologise to canola growers and industry per personnel this situation should not have occurred, but due to strong interest in Karoo, that's the seed, the unusual step was made of undertaking contract seed production in New Zealand, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the second statement, now that's bad enough, I think, um, but the second statement said this. I'd like to stress, this second statement was in a letter which was sent to all the, supply, all the growers. I'd like to stress at this stage that this does not excuse De Vuro in failing in its duty of care <laughs> to inform growers as to the presence of these weed seeds. We got it wrong <laughs> in this case. And new varieties will not be brought on the market again um, in this manner, etc., etc. Now, that's pretty extraordinary. Both those statements were what we call full apologies. So they weren't an apology that just says, oh, I'm, a bit, I'm sorry this has happened, or, you know, I'm sorry your leg came off, the fact that I cut it off has nothing to do with it, that kind of apology. They were the real thing. Um, 
Now, the interesting thing is that this went all the way to the High Court on whether that, that statement constituted an admission um, sufficient to determine whether there had been a breach of the duty of care. And the High Court held that it is, did not. So the High Court said, even though this had been admitted, it had been um, brought in, he said, they said, where admissions constitute a matter which will become a legal conclusion about the, about the legal standard required, the, admission, the admissions can have no effect and they cannot amount to a basis for a finding of negligence. Okay, this does not mean that the facts that are mentioned can't be regarded as proved and so on. We're not, I'm not saying that this means that there's no way any of those facts were, were things that could not ultimately come to a conclusion that there was a finding of negligence. But the fact that they apologised with an acknowledgement of fault was not what caused the problem for them. This is a very important thing to keep in mind. It may not be the case in all the other jurisdictions and it may not be the case in the United States, but it is clearly the case in Australia and it is probably the case in the UK where there's also a line of cases saying similar things, that it is for the court to come to a conclusion about legal liability. It is not for the parties, whoever they are. So, um, where am I? So, if it is not an admission, therefore, it won't void an insurance contract. So that's, that's um, a significant thing. Now, coming to the, the second point, um, if it's, the second point is, is quite important. If an apology is admitted, in the same way as a confession being admitted into, it may be more prejudicial than probative. It may be that the fact that somebody says, I did it, um, is sufficiently comforting to a jury in particular and maybe a judge for them to feel much more likely, much more comfortable with coming to a conclusion of liability or guilt. Now that is an issue. Um, now it's much less an issue in those jurisdictions where there are no juries and particularly where judges can be directed not to draw that conclusion. But it remains an issue that I think should be taken seriously where juries where juries are involved, even though there's very few of those in Australia. Um, okay, so it can be argued that the new legislation um, is really um, just simply a restatement of the common law and really makes no difference and that the difference ought to be um, that, it, that it's having it in legislative form makes it easier to point to for the purposes of telling people, such as insurers, lawyers and medical practitioners, that apologies are not um, such a dangerous thing to have. Um, the question, there are a whole range of questions about admissibility and apologies which I'm very um, anxious about going into in front of people like Jill Hunter who's sitting over there. Um, and, but I don't, I don't think I really need to go into the detail of it though I have in other papers. I think the point is that it is really not clear from the legislation as we have it that all aspects of an apology would be protected from admission in all cases because I'm going to talk about the differences between the various forms of legislation next. Okay, so here we have a table which looks at a number of types of protected apology legislation. I've put Massachusetts 1986 in there. If you just have a look at the first column which says the definition includes, includes an acknowledgement of fault. What I want you to notice there is how few of the jurisdictions have that in their, in their legislation. So New South Wales and the ACT, Queensland since last year, um, British Columbia and Colorado a health only provision. And there are quite a lot of United States provisions which include the acknowledgement of fault but usually only where they're talking about medical malpractice or adverse events in medicine. The, the Massachusetts one says, um, where am I? It says that it won't be admissible if it is an expression of regret. So it really doesn't allow an acknowledgement of fault in order to um, have the apology protected. The New South Wales one um, says that the apology is an apology regardless of whether there is an admission of fault in it or not. And it is the same as the British Columbia provision which was actually modelled on New South Wales. Um, that is, 
an expression of sympathy or regret, a statement that one is sorry, or any other words or actions indicating contrition or commiseration, whether or not the words or actions admit or imply an admission of fault in connection with the matter to which the words or actions relate. So the elements there are that fault is okay. You can say any nice things you like, we don't mind what <coughs> nice things they are, but you can say it was my fault in those words and that will be in a protected apology. Now notice that the only provision which actually says directly and expressly that an apology does not void an insurance clause is that of, of British Columbia. Um, and it also has a statute of limitations provision so that time doesn't run from, um, so an apology also doesn't make time run for those purposes. But the vast majority of the, of the legislation, um, and it has now become most United States have some version of protection of apology, mostly on the Massachusetts model for general um, things, except if there's a medical part. And the majority of the jurisdictions in Australia also limit their protected apology to a mere expression of regret, or what I would call a partial apology, not a full apology. So what I'm going to do now is say something naughty. This is the worst example. Um, I think this is the worst example. It not only, um, first of all, it's extraordinarily hard to work out what it means. So an apology, an offer of treatment or other redress shall not of itself amount to an admission of negligence or breach of statutory duty. There's no definition of apology at all in this provision, which means that it's very likely that if it's seen at all, it will be confined to expression of regret. Um, but apart from that, looking at the, the case law in, in the United Kingdom, it looks as if this, this piece of legislation does absolutely nothing. Um, it's really was a waste of time and it was very much an afterthought. It was the rest of the, of the legislation, the Compensation Act was, was in the House of Lords and the House of Lords put that in at the last minute um, and there was about three, three sentences of conversation about it and it just went through. They thought it was all common sense. <coughs> so there's the, um, the British Columbia Apology Act. It was modelled on the New South Wales one but it has these extra elements that I talked about before. I don't expect you to read them all now. Um, but, it has the, but the elements are the definition, which I haven't given you there, but a definition that includes an acknowledgement of fault, um, that it's not an express or implied admission of fault or liability, it's not a confirmation of a cause of action for the purposes of the Limitation Act, doesn't affect insurance, mustn't be taken into account into any determination of fault or liability etc. And it's not admissible and must not be referred to. Now the only problem this one comes up to, comes up against, is the possibility that where no apology has been allowed into court at all, a jury, if there is one, might decide this person is a real, a real bastard who never apologised to this person. And that is also possibly an issue. But apart from that, it really covers the field. It's quite clear that they really mean it. It's only, but it was only 2006. We have not yet seen any cases discussing these and we haven't seen the effects of these pieces of legislation on the, on the common law. So what is wrong with the wrong one and right with the, the right one? Basically, the definition is the problem. Um, I already talked about the fact that definitions of apology um, need to include an expression of regret. Um, and that legislation like the UK one and the Massachusetts one are so limited that um, not only do they not really do anything, but when you try to put them into effect, people are so confused that they don't know what they can say. And they get, and we have seen this in the medical context, where doctors who are aware of this get really confused, and I'll talk about that briefly in a moment. That's what I mean by the confusion about what you can and cannot say. Um, if you're told that you can say ev everything except acknowledging fault, you're likely to spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to say I'm sorry without anything else. Um, the, and I think it's also clear, if we look at, the, um, at these partial apologies, that there are real problems with them. 
Now we not only have general psychological evidence about apologies of various kinds, but we act, there is actually quite a significant literature, a lot of it done by a woman called Jennifer Robineau, um, who has um, done a whole lot of studies looking at apologies, not only in the context of how people respond generally, but in simulated legal situations, um, including whether people are willing to accept settlement or not and so on. So there's actually um, quite, a lot of, uh, quite a lot of these, these things. Now, lawyers will call a partial apology a safe apology. So they will say, well, it's safe to do that and it's safe because it's not going to be an admission and it, it really, it might operate as a soothing device, they think. Um, and, and of course, um, there's no risk at all, as I said, of legal liability. Um, now, the psychological evidence suggests something a bit different. The psychological evidence suggests that um, when people get, because when people get a full apology as opposed to a partial apology, their response may be to become very aggressive in relation to the partial apologizer, um, so that the full apology can seems as if it can be effective in reducing people's desire to litigate. It seems that it can enhance people's willingness to settle. Um, but that if you give someone a partial apology, you may actually increase their litigious, uh, litigiousness and you may actually reduce their desire to settle. And um, there are a number of studies in a medical context which support this. Um, so it's absolutely clear that most people think that, a, um, that an apology is, an apo is something that includes an acknowledgement of fault and that that's what people want, and that if you don't give them the acknowledgement of fault, they are likely to become very cross and possibly do something that you don't like. Now, I just want to talk, in the United States, you will have noticed that the Colorado provision was very much about medical negligence and so on. Um, and the reason that this, this sort of legislation came in is because of a number of hospitals, of whom the most famous is the Lexing Lexington Veterans Hospital in Kansas, um, which led people to think that they should actually have apologies. What happened in Lexington was that the hospital had a very bad couple of years in the late 1980s when the lit the, they, their budget for litigation was dramatically increased and they did very, very badly indeed. And the medical practitioner's response to this was to get together, and again, this is another thing where I think the, insur the insurers and the lawyers would have just probably, maybe they all had heart attacks and died and that's why it was possible for this to go ahead. But these, um, but these people decided, the, do the doctors decided that if this was going to happen anyway, they were going to disclose all adverse events, whether or not the patients had noticed them. They were going to disclose them in writing. They were going to disclose them verbally as well. And they were going to, um, and that included acknowledging their own fault, where there was that fault. And they set this program in train, and, um, which was, and everybody thought, well, the litigation's going to go through the roof. In fact, it didn't work like that. What happened was, not that there was no litigation or that there were no patient complaints, but that the settlement rate rose dramatically. And because the settlement rate rose, rose dramatically, the um, litigation budget dropped dramatically. So what we had was a situation where people were getting very, very clear apologies that included an acknowledgement of fault. And because that had happened, A, there was less need for litigation. You didn't, they, they just didn't have to argue with the doctor about about anything, but they were acknowledging fault and saying, oh well, well, and this would you know, probably look like a negligence case and so on. But they were settling earlier because there was less of the need that people often feel to, to push for the apology, which is lots and lots and lots of the research about propensity to sue gives evidence of people saying, but I wanted them to apologise. And in the past, that has traditionally been put, has been brushed aside as saying, oh, that's just what people say. But actually, this suggests that people really do want an apology and they want it for, for um, the reason, including the acknowledgement of fault. And of course, they also want redress and assurance that the thing that went wrong won't happen again and so on. 
So in Australia, we'd, we began to develop what's known as the open disclosure process, which is a process in the public <laughs> hospitals which has been rolled out over the last few years where doctors and nurses and other medical staff are trained and where there's a process of open disclosure, which means um, saying that the event has happened, um, telling them what's happened um, and explaining it all. The same in the, in, um, the United Kingdom, um, a similar sort of process called NHS redress has gone on. Now there's a problem. The problem is that the open disclosure process is national, whereas the apology protecting legislation is state-based. So what we have, because we have um, four or five, six jurisdictions which define apologies with as only expressions of regret and a few jurisdictions that are, uh, define apology as including an acknowledgement of fault, the open disclosure guidelines, even in those states where there is a, a full apology protected, have gone for the bare minimum. So if you have a look at what they say, um, as part of the open disclosure, what they say is, you must offer an apology or expression of regret. But look at that, it must not be an admission of liability. Staff must be careful not to make any verbal or written statement that admits liability. And the apology that they're talking about does not blame the health facility for the harm. It does not blame a clinician for the harm. It does not blame the health service for the harm caused to the patient. It does not indicate that the incident could have been avoided. What does the psychological literature tell us is likely to be the outcome of this kind of thing? Increased litigation. Um, it's, so it's quite striking that even in a state like New South Wales where there's a full and complete apology protection, our medical staff are being trained not to apologise because of the national state tension. Um, in my opinion, that's a real problem um, and, it, uh, and it is having a significant chilling effect because when you say things like that to medicos, I've been to... Um, uh, I've given papers at the equivalent of CLE for medicos and, and, and they've been told this and they say, but what can I say? You know, they, they are really confused about what you can say if you're not supposed to do any of those things. And what they end up with is saying, gee, I'm really sorry your leg came off, your wrong leg came off. <laughs> now, how do you feel if your wrong legs come off? I mean, you don't feel that that has soothed in any way, do you? Um, it is actually likely to set you on the warpath. So there are real problems, I think, in Australia um, in relation to... The, so that's the first problem, the problem that open disclosure and national programs are really stymied by the patchy nature of the legislation across Australia. The second problem is that we have... Nobody seems to know. People in the open disclosure process know that they've been told these things, but insurers don't seem to know about this legislation. Um, so they're, going, they're continuing to advise their clients. So if a client says, I apologise, they'll say, oh, well, you've voided your insurance. Um, sorry, we're not going to pay you. That doesn't go to court. Nobody goes to court and says, you, avoid, you know, I shouldn't have avoided that because they don't know that there's anything to protect them. They accept what the insurer says. And most of the lawyers don't seem to have read the Civil Liability Acts either. So they don't know, and they're not advising their clients. So there's a, there's a huge gap in knowledge about what has actually been um, a significant legislative and media process. Somehow, we have managed to miss <laughs> all the people that we, we thought were being told this don't seem to have it. Um, and in fact, there is a, a really nice um, paper by our colleague Chris Foster and, um, and her co-author Salem, which surveyed general practitioners. It's not that surprising that, they, that most of them, 71%, had not heard of the Civil Liability Act. I don't expect that. But they also had no idea that litigation had dropped. They still thought it had continued. 82% um, said that their fear of lawsuits continued to substantially... Um, lessen their enjoyment of medicine. Now that, is, that doesn't reflect the reality at all, but it continues to be the perception. Um, 
So we really do need a great deal of education in relation to um, our lawyers, our medical practitioners and <coughs> our insurers. Um, so I charge you to go out <laughs> and tell people about this. <laughs> um, so we need that education. We also need, we need to have uniform legislation um, and that uniform legislation needs to, needs to be legislation which acknowledges fault. Now I'm hopeful that we will move there because Queensland just changed its definition to include acknowledgement of fault, so hopefully some others will follow. Um, but I don't know of anybody else doing it at the moment. So, um, so this brings me to my conclusion, which is, which is really that I hope I've convinced you that there is actually much of value in um, legislative protection of apologies, largely because at the very least, if it is effective, it can avoid the chilling effect on social discourse and so on um, of having, even in jurisdictions like New South Wales, of having lawyers and other people advising people not to sue. Um, but I guess in my opinion it actually goes a little way towards um, if it's effective and if we can educate people properly and so on, um, it, it could go a little way towards um, just making our society a little bit friendlier and a little bit more likely to get on with each other, which seems to me like a good idea. <laughs>